Good. All right. I'm Liz Sibley Fletcher, um, uh, one of the conference planning members, and I'm here to introduce Bishop Terry Brown, who is an amazing, well, church character. He is an Anglican bishop, retired, an international Christian educator and historian, and an advocate for human rights. Bishop Brown's connection with the Jonathan Baylor Society is through his researches on Father Smythe's work with the Society of the Catholic Commonwealth. Sorry. <laughs> okay. And Father Smythe appears in Jonathan Baylor's work, fictionalized as Father Duncan, who is an important character. Now, Terry Brown was born in Iowa and spent his childhood there and then lived in Michigan for high school and college. Like so many young men of his time, he was caught up in the Vietnam War and where he stationed in Japan as a man. Here he met a Japanese friend who was a graduate of Trinity Divinity College, in Canada, and also a member of the Society of the Catholic Commonwealth, SCC initially. This was an international group of Christian Marxists led by Gloucester's father, Smythe. It was a formative experience for Terry Brown. After his army service, he enrolled in Trinity College and in 1975 was ordained an Anglican priest. Later, he was confirmed as an Episcopalian by Massachusetts first black bishop, Bishop Burgess of Boston. Terry Brown's experience in Japan led him to church work overseas, where he served six years as theological lecturer at Bishop Patterson Theological College in the Solomon Islands. He also worked for the Canadian church throughout the Asian Pacific, Korea, the Philippines, Burma, Myanmar, as an advocate for religious education and human rights. Returning from the South Pacific, Terry Brown pursued graduate study at Trinity, earning his doctorate of theology with his dissertation on Father Smythe and the SCC. Bishop Brown's love for the Solomon Islands brought him back there, where he was elected the Bishop of Malaita in 1996, serving until his retirement in 2008. Malaita province is the most populous and one of the largest of the nine provinces of the Solomon Islands. It's named after its largest island, Malaita, where Bishop Brown was based. It has a large diocese of 35,000 Anglicans, which increased in its congregations under Bishop Brown's tenure. Bishop Brown was in the front lines of human rights during the country's major ethnic tension crisis which included a military coup and human rights abuses. He also worked with Anglican women's community who aided victims of domestic violence. Throughout his time in the Solomons, Bishop Brown was the only non-Indigenous bishop who worked entirely under local auspices. And there were nine bishops total in the Solomon Islands. After retiring as bishop, Terry Brown stayed on as a volunteer, organizing the Anglican Church of Melanesia's archives. And he edited the final report on the Solomon Islands Truth and Reconciliation Commission in 2012. After completing this work, he returned to Canada where he serves as Bishop in charge of the Church of the Ascension in Hamilton, Ontario. Bishop Brown's list of publications is awesome. Some of his books are Justice as Mission, An Agenda for the Church, Other Voices, Other Worlds, The Global Church Speaks Out on Homosexuality, Resurrection Struggle, The First 50 Years of the Community of the Sisters of the Church of Solomon Islands. That's forthcoming. Some of his articles in professional journals are Challenging the Colonial Gay, Empathy, Agents, and Community in the South Pacific. Also, Canadian Anglicans Discover Marxism, 
among many of his fascinating publications. Although Bishop Brown never met Father Smythe, who died in 1960, he spent intense time with Father Smythe while writing his doctoral dissertation on the Christian Marxism of Father Frederick Hastings Smythe. And here is Bishop Terry Brown coming to us from his home in Hamilton, Ontario. Thank you, Liz, for that very generous introduction. Um, it's a, a pleasure and a privilege for me to speak for uh, maybe a half an hour or short of a half an hour on Father Smythe and the Society of the Catholic Commonwealth. And I have a little, some notes I'm going to speak from. Liz gave a little bit of a biographical introduction uh, of myself. Uh, and uh, as she said, when I was in the army in Japan, I met a priest there who was a member of the SCC and he gave me pamphlets, some of Father Smythe's little pamphlets, and I was quite interested in them. Uh, and then when I uh, went uh, eventually to uh, theological college, I met uh, Cyril Powells, who was a, a Japanese, oh. son of a Japanese bishop uh, and a member of the SCC, Japanese historian. Uh, and I began to hear more about Father Smythe. I began to read his writings. Uh, and um, it was in the curriculum under Anglican social thought, and I began to write about Father Smythe a little bit. When I was ordained in New Brunswick, um, I met Father Elmer Smith, who was the last um, uh, superior of the Society of the Catholic Commonwealth uh, when it, when it uh, closed shop in, uh, in uh, 1966. And he had the archives, he had the papers of the society. So I decided that down the road, I would like to write the history uh, as my doctoral dissertation. In the meantime, I went back to the Solomons, I went to the Solomons to teach, but there I began corresponding with uh, former members of the society. I met with members who lived in Japan and Korea, uh, and the tape which you heard came out of some of those uh, interviews, that tape is from 1959, the chapter in Gloucester in 1959. Uh, and then I came back on a couple of furloughs in 1978, 1980. I went down to New Brunswick. I began looking at the papers. I gathered material to take back to read. Uh, and then finally, I came back to graduate school in 1981 to Toronto. And I worked on the research on uh, Father Smythe. Um, the archives were in uh, Elmer when he left, uh, well, Newburyport, the last place of the oratory, uh, took all the papers with him and stored them in a chicken coop, uh, the attic of a, of a chicken, uh, uh, hat, well, uh, egg factory, I guess you would say. Uh, and so they were very dry, but they smelled of chicken a little bit, but, uh, but they were a wonderful archive to work from. Now, what attracted me to Father Smythe and uh, uh, SCC. I was raised a Presbyterian, uh, and in the in university, I was attracted to the Episcopal Church uh, because of its sacramental life. It felt more participatory than just sitting in a pew listening to sermons, and I had friends who were Episcopalians. I liked the music. I began to get an inkling of the sacramental theology, and so when I went to graduate school in at Brandeis, that was when I was uh, confirmed uh, in 1967. Uh, and then I, of course, went, uh, uh, went uh, back. Uh, well, I left graduate school. That was when I got drafted, went to the army and so forth. After I got out of the army, I went to a little bit more graduate school and then through the friend I had met in Japan, uh, moved to uh, Toronto. Now I had always been kind of on the left politically I wasn't very happy about being drafted into the army during the Vietnam War. When I got out, I participated in anti-war uh, movements. Uh, and I found that Father Smythe's theology uh, brought together my sacramental interests, uh, the Eucharist, the importance of the Eucharist, and my social justice interests and peacemaking and reconciliation interests. Uh, that. Um, Participation in the Eucharist is a self-offering of one's work for justice. It's taken into the divine, comes back in the sacrament, 
and then one is sent out into the world, a kind of a cyclical understanding. And as I studied uh, Anglican theology uh, in preparation for ordination, I discovered the Anglo-Catholic uh, socialist tradition, the tradition of slum priests. Uh, St. Stephen, South Boston would be a good example in, in Massachusetts of a, of, a, of a parish working amongst the poor, but very high liturgically Anglican with, with, with incense and music and vestments and a very strong theology of, of the Eucharist. Uh, and I decided that was the kind of priest I really wanted to be uh, and that the theology of Father Smythe and the SCC fit that uh, model. And then of course I met members of the, of the recently um, wound down society who still had the same beliefs and so forth. And I became kind of the heir to the SCC, although the community no longer existed formally. Now to say a few words about Father Smythe and his background, um, Frederick Hastings Smythe was born in 1888 from a wealth of a wealthy upstate New York family uh, in Utica and Clinton, New York. He was an only child. He was privileged. He was spoiled. He came from a family of scientists. His father died when he was very young and he was very much cosseted by his mother. Uh, the family money, the Smythe money, came from the paint business, uh, a paint factory in Clinton that produced the red, red rust resistant paint used on barns, iron bridges, and uh, box cars. So you can see there was some market for that paint. He was a brilliant student at Hamilton College, Liberal Arts College in Clinton, New York, and his classmates included Alexander Wolcott, uh, and Ezra Pound. He went on to do PhD studies in physical chemistry at MIT. Uh, he worked in the chemical warfare service in Washington uh, during World War I and designed its insignia. And then he did research in physical chemistry at the Carnegie Institute. Uh, but he lost interest in chemistry and science. Uh, it just didn't do anything for him. Uh, and he had some interest in the church. He briefly attended General Theological Seminary in New York, uh, but that wasn't, didn't really take off either. Uh, and but then his mother died, leaving him the company. Uh, and he put that in the hands of a, uh, an administrator. And he went off to Europe uh, in 1920, as in his own words, a dilettante. <coughs> living in Rome with a young American friend, Ethan Allen Brown, whom he put through uh, medical school. He learned Italian, he interviewed Mussolini. He, he was attracted a bit to Italian fascism, uh, but, but when he got to know some of the Italian uh, modernist theologians who did not like fascism and were being persecuted, he changed his tune. Um, he took a job in England with the scientist Sir Almuth Wright, uh, and he began to travel in Anglo-Catholic circles, and he began to think about the relationship between post-Newtonian physics and theology. You know, the Heisenberg principle, uh, moving beyond the Newtonian mechanics, uh, quantum mechanics, and so forth, and he thought he might have a role as a kind of Christian apologist, uh, relating to the new science, models of science that were emerging. At the same time, he was exposed to Anglo-Catholic socialism and Marxism, especially Conrad Noel, who was quite a famous Anglo-Catholic Marxist. He had a little church in Thaxted in Essex, and he raised the red flag at the time of the Russian Revolution. He raised this, uh, uh, the Irish uh, uh, Sinn Féin flag, a green flag for the Irish Revolution, and was quite a, a controversial figure. He too came from quite a wealthy background. Um, and uh, Father Smythe developed, began to develop this image of himself as an Anglo-Catholic theologian, both, both working with science, but also the science of, as it were, Marxist dialectics. Uh, he was taken on by Bishop George Bell, the famous Bishop of Chichester, uh, who challenged Winston Churchill about the carpet bombing of Dresden. 
and didn't become the Archbishop of Canterbury because of that. Uh, he studied, Smythe studied at Chichester Theological College. And he was ordained and was a curate briefly at St. Martin's, uh, an Anglo-Catholic parish in Brighton. And he did some lecturing on Christianity and science. Um, however, in um, 1933, he decided to come back to the States. Um, he didn't see much future for himself in England. The money was running out. Uh, and <coughs> he came home and approached Hamilton College uh, to establish a small oratory. Now the word oratory is a, is a, a, a kind of a, a Catholic post-Reformation term, a house of prayer uh, from the uh, Latin word for prayer, a little different than a monastery. It concentrated on being a kind of a base for going out and ministering rather than a Benedictine monastery, for example. So he wanted to establish a small oratory adjacent to the campus to minister to students in the area of science and religion. Uh, however, that worked for a while, but pretty soon his political views began to come forward and the college was not happy about his leftist political views. And they had just got out of a relationship with the Presbyterian church and the local Episcopal church in town was not very happy about his relations with students. Uh, so eventually the college built a fence between the oratory and, and the college virtually cutting him off. So he had to find a new place to minister to students. So he decided uh, to move to Cambridge, Massachusetts in September, 1936. And there were um, uh, three, uh, uh, three successive oratories uh, in Cambridge. Um, the first one from 1936 to 1938 was on Quincy Street, uh, almost on the Harvard campus, quite close to the Memorial Hall. Uh, and he concentrated on ministering to students, to Harvard students, uh, and bringing, to, bringing them in, giving teaching about uh, his theology of the Eucharist, about his uh, Marxist social analysis, their integration, and so forth. Harvard University was not happy with this arrangement, uh, and they refused to renew his lease. Uh, so he uh, then, because the theology was also very much about the working class and relating with the Communist Party uh, on the local issues, and Smyth was involved in lots of demonstrations and, and um, uh, front organ uh, 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 United Front organizations and so forth. So he moved the oratory to Putnam Street. Uh, I don't know if anybody knows Boston, but it's in a much more of a working class area. And he was there from 1938 to 1946. And while he was there, he established formally the Society of the Catholic Commonwealth. And that took place at the oratory on October 4th, 1939. And he and three others, uh, three other lay people, one was a, a Harvard uh, student uh, organizer, and two others were, uh, they were monastics interested in the religious life. And it was done through Christ Church uh, Cambridge, but eventually uh, because of the, the political content, uh, the rector was kind of was not very enthused and that relationship uh, didn't uh, survive. But he was licensed every year by the Episcopal Bishop of Massachusetts, who was an old friend of the family and thought that the Episcopal Church could absorb uh, this kind of theology. Um, he uh, uh, didn't relate with other parishes. The oratory functioned on its own. Uh, at Putnam Avenue, he was in <clears throat> a working class area. This was a time of maximum relationships with the Communist Party, involvement in support of radical politics, strikes. There was a taxi strike that the oratory was headquarters of. Um, and this brought him to the attention of the FBI. And from 1941, he was under FBI surveillance. A lawyer friend was able to get me his FBI files under the Freedom of Information Act. And that was great, of great interest, although much of the information was redacted, although I could figure out mo most of it. Um, Father Smythe knew he was being uh, under FBI surveillance. At one point, an FBI agent pretended he was a student 
wanting to know all about the society. And Father Smythe knew right away, this guy is, is not a student, he's, a, he's an FBI agent. Um, but interestingly, in the end, the FBI decided that Father Smythe was, quote unquote, more odd than dangerous. Uh, and I think that probably was, was in some ways true. Um, um, but um, during this time, he published his first major theological book, Manhood into God, uh, which refers to humanity taken into the divine uh, from the creed of St. Athanasius. Um, at the same time, he realized really how difficult it was to work with the, with the working class in Boston. They were Portuguese, they were Irish, they were Roman Catholics, and they really didn't take to English Anglophilia uh, in terms of his worship and ethos and so forth. So in a way, he kind of gave up on working directly with the, um, with the working class in Boston. So in 1946, the oratory moved to Washington Avenue in Cambridge. And it was a middle-class middle neighborhood, a big house, huge house. Um, he did writing, advocacy. He built up the Society of the Catholic Commonwealth membership. He wrote two more books, Discerning the Lord's Body and Sacrifice. Um, he still welcomed Harvard students and working class types. And he developed two kinds of SCC membership. There were the religious members who were like monks. They took the traditional vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And then they were the secular members who were married, many times married uh, clergy and their spouses. Uh, they could be single, they could uh, be, and they were all over the world. Um, Canada, US, England, uh, Korea, and Japan. And, um, but the thing is, the, the secular membership took off, but the religious membership didn't. Uh, the only uh, person who actually ended up staying was Father Johnston, uh, Don Johnston, who was not, when he entered, was not yet a priest, 1948. And in uh, the, the novels, the uh, Gloucester novels, He's Father Economist for a reason that I'll explain in a minute. But he came in 1948 uh, after an unhappy divorce. Uh, and then he was sponsored for ordination, went to Harvard Divinity School, and he uh, became the second regular member of the society. Uh, but he had a lot of personal issues. I think he was bipolar, but he got interested in the stock market. So he was um, trained. Uh, sponsored to take training in buying and selling of stocks. He worked with companies and eventually he was licensed on the New York Stock Exchange and began managing the oratory's uh, properties uh, and uh, then taking on the properties of others as well. And that eventually became something of a problem. Um, in, the, in the Washington Avenue oratory, there was much more emphasis on uh, liturgy, um, uh, development of the anamnesis about which I've, I've written in an upcoming uh, Bayless uh, Society bulletin. Uh, he also was having health problems. He was now in his late 50s, mid 50s. He'd had a heart attack. The house was too big. There were no other regular members. Father Johnston was not easy to live with. And Father Smythe had a little bit of a Jekyll and Hyde personality. He could be absolutely charming when you agreed with him. But if you disagreed with him, he might send you packing. Uh, and that didn't make for easy living with him. So he decided he needed to a quieter place uh, and that the oratory was moving from a oratory model more to a Benedictine model of daily offices and the religious life and he needed quiet. So that was when he decided to buy the property in Gloucester. He was, <clears throat> he was attracted by the quietness of Gloucester. So in September 55, he sold the Washington Avenue house and took on a big mortgage to buy the Gloucester house, the Ralph Adams Cram house. Um, Father Smythe and Father Johnston moved to Gloucester and Father Smythe said of it, so much more retired environment and more quietness in every way. He was welcomed by the town. He assisted at St. John's Episcopal Church. Uh, 
He took, again, the worship took on a more liturgical focus, as you heard in the tape, uh, and little less political activism, much correspondence with SCC members around the world, uh, the chapters, and they came together for chapters at Gloucester. He also changed his mind quite a lot about Marxism. Uh, by now, uh, the truth about Stalin was becoming very clear. Uh, he, he appreciated Khrushchev's denunciation of Stalin. If you know the Lysenko controversy about, um, in terms of genetics, that, um, that, um, that characteristics, that, that the theory that characteristics that, uh, that one acquire can then be passed on genetically. As a scientist, Father Smythe thought that the, the Marxist or Stalinist espousal of the Lysenko uh, genetics was just crazy, or just unacceptable. So, um, so you hear in the tape a reference to, uh, to uh, fascism on the left and on the right, not just the right. So anyway, by the time he got to Gloucester, although it wasn't true of other SCC members, Father Smythe had become much more moderate and much more um, interested in, um, in fine tuning uh, litur liturgical theology and this relationship with society and the church. Um, and as I said, Father Johnston now was trained as a stockbroker, licensed in the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, he attracted other investments and schemes using the oratory's uh, tax-free status. Um, but it was a kind of difficult time. Father Smythe was worried about the future of the society. There was no one clear to succeed him. Father Johnston was unstable, uh, all mixed up with the, with the stock market. In 1958, there was a, a fire which damaged the furniture and the library. I have a few books from that library and they're all smoke damaged. Um, and uh, his, Father Smythe's health was declining. I learned some interesting, uh, uh, the, the cure for his heart disease was a rice diet. And Father Smythe was an epicure. He really, there, there was good food and drink at the oratory. Father Smythe believed that uh, in that tradition of, of eating well and celebrating life. So he had to go on a, a, a rice diet, which I think is no longer regarded as a very good cure for heart disease. But anyway, um, and, but finally he died, uh, Easter Eve, uh, April, 1960. Uh, and members came from all over the, world for the funeral. Uh, the bishop uh, took part in the funeral, Bishop of Massachusetts, and Father Johnston was elected the new uh, superior. Uh, he wasn't very functional. He tried to remove the Marxist elements completely. The members did not approve of that, and, and he was still involved in financial dealings, and there was a great land investment in Spain of all purposes, so he was flying back and forth to Spain, um, and uh, Father Elmer Smith, who was a parish priest of St. Peter's, Portland, Maine, uh, became the vicar supervisor. And eventually Father Johnston imploded. Uh, he uh, renounced his orders as a priest, became a Roman Catholic and went to Spain uh, to advise the Roman church on land. And he died in 1967. I don't know really the details of his death. So at that point, Father Elmer Smith took over uh, as uh, the superior. And he decided to sell, couldn't afford to continue to pay the mortgage on the lost oratory. So he sold, the mortgage was foreclosed in 63, and he bought a small house in Newburyport in May 63. But still the society was unsustainable because there was still a mortgage to be paid on the Newburyport house. And many of the, most of the, uh, uh, the regular, the secular members were just parish priests with, there was nobody with any money, parish priests on low clergy pay uh, or missionaries. So there wasn't much. Uh, and and the, the members had this impression the oratory was very, very wealthy. And then when it all collapsed uh, and Elmer decided to just let the money go because it was dirty money, then it was a bit of a shock that the, that the society needed money and they decided they couldn't do it and met together in August 19th. 67 at the farmhouse of one of the members uh, and decided to close down the society. So the last celebration of the anamnesis was in August uh, 1967. And that's the point at which Father Elmer uh, gathered up the furniture and the papers and the library 
and everything and went uh, north to New Brunswick where he had for years been a salmon fisher. Elmer was a great salmon fisher, fisherman, and he liked New Brunswick and moved up to Fredericton Diocese. Uh, one funny story, I'm just about done, and I think we're within time, when Elmer had brought all of this stuff from the oratory up to Canada and he came to Canadian customs, they said, what is this stuff you're bringing? Uh, and, and he tried to explain it, and we don't think you can bring all that to Canada. And Elmer said, well, listen, there's a field over there and I'm gonna take the, all this stuff, stuff over there and you'll see the biggest bonfire you've ever seen. Uh, and that changed the custom officer's mind and all the stuff made it to Elmer's rectory. Uh, now, just one word about why the SCC did not survive. Typical case of a, of a charismatic a leader that was not replaceable very well, brilliant, uh, always had an answer, always willing to dialogue, and that was not anybody else uh, in the society. And that the, the superior had to be a regular member. And so there, were, there wasn't any choice for, um, for someone to uh, replace him really. Father Johnston couldn't do it. Um, and then the 60s, you know, were a time of revolution and in theology, uh, demythologizing, death of God, theological liberalism, honest to God, uh, and the general decline and trust of authority. And, um, and that, uh, that SCC theology, Thomism, Marxist Thomism needed some trust in revelation and authority. I think the, the wheel is coming around uh, and uh, it is a more attractive theology. And, and in some ways, it, it, when I argue that, it's a, that, that Smike was a forerunner to Latin American liberation theology, which used a Marxist analysis. Um, I think I've already said en enough about my own research. So I think I'll leave it there. Um, I haven't, I mean, I think I absorbed Father Smythe's theology and practice. When I was a bishop, I had an open house and, and I, it felt sometimes a little bit like what the oratory must have been like. Um, there, there was always food and, and, and it was a place of hospitality and all the different members of the society did some very interesting things afterwards. One became a member of parliament in Canada, others were academics, others parish priests, and, they, and the anamnesis, the liturgy, continued to be celebrated informally uh, uh, right down into uh, this century. So it's, it, I think that Father Smythe is still to be rediscovered, uh, but my thesis is online, uh, and uh, I, I encourage you to read if you're interested, and, and I welcome any questions at this point. Thank you so much. This has been very enlightening about, um, you know, Father Smythe was a person I only met briefly as a child. And in your analysis is wonderful because it does seem like the Commonwealth depended too, uh, the society of the Catholic Commonwealth depended too much upon him. But if he had opened it up more to the lay people, you know, being able to carry on. It's possible, do you think it's possible they could have carried on as more a lay society? Well, um, many of the, many of the, um, um, the secular members were ordained, in fact. They were married to parish priests and both the priest and his wife were members in, all, in many cases, not always. Particularly the Canadians had a lot of couples. In some cases, the wives were hostile and that was a problem. So it would have taken, um, it wouldn't necessarily have been lay, but it would have been a married person. Uh, and you would therefore need uh, somebody who uh, had a spouse that was sympathetic and raising a family at the oratory. There weren't very many, I mean, Elmer was one of a few single uh, regular members or secular members. Uh, and that was why he was qualified to be a superior. They could have changed their constitution uh, but but it's, it's like, I mean, there are some modern religious communities that include families, uh, but when you get a whole family with kids, uh, uh, it's, it's a little bit of a different dynamic. And again, that would have had to have been supported financially, um, would have had, uh, yeah. and so, so I think it's a little, a little difficult. It could have, they could have somehow turned it into something else, but, but there wasn't any member who had the brilliance. I mean, they were smart people. Uh, and some of them were quite brilliant, but they didn't quite have 
uh, well, Smythe was so wound up with his own interpretation of things. He was, I mean, people just were enthralled of his insights and so forth. So, uh, but as you say, it was a bit, they could have tried. I think they thought, <clears throat> Talked about some of the different options, but but a but a married priest with a family running it would have been a really difficult dynamic too. Understandable. Yes. Now, are there any questions from folks out here in the room? Not not sure. Okay, because the um, the picture that was shown of the oratory earlier, I don't know if the one in in Gloucester, I don't know if you could see that. Oh, I, know, I know the picture, yes, yes. Yes, it looks so imposing and rather bleak, mm. um, but a lot of vegetation has grown up. And even in my day, there was more, mm. which was like the late fifties, there was more vegetation. Mm. Um, but it is interesting, the whole financial angle of it. And um, Jonathan does pick that up in his books mm -hmm. about how, um, there was a lot of controversy among the society about the acceptability of money. Um, although it seems like without money, they couldn't keep managing. <laughs> well, the, the society had a couple of, of traditional worker priests. Uh, there was a priest in the East End of London, John Rowe, uh, who started out as a parish priest and decided to become a, a worker priest in the tradition of the French Catholic worker priests. And so he worked in Truman's Brewery uh, for a long time. And he, he became a, a shop steward and worked with, the, um, with the, the labor union and so forth. But even he found it a little awkward to what do, you, what do you do when you're working with people? How do you get them interested in the SCC theology when they're working, producing beer? And then Dan Heap, who was, became a worker priest in Toronto at a box factory, a corrugated box factory, and he had, I mean, they were both on the left. And, and so uh, when Father Johnston wanted to be a worker priest on the stock market, and considering that the society was Marxist and, uh, and Smythe talked about spoiling the Egyptian, using, the, using this money and using the stock market to bring down the stock market. And the, the more leftist members of the society just felt this was bizarre. And the bishop wasn't very keen either, uh, but um, Father Smythe, they had had some trust monies and Johnston was very interested. He was initially gifted, but I think his bipolar personality, you don't want to be bipolar and playing the stock market at the same time. And then uh, he would just, uh, and then he would took other people's money and using the tax-free status. And so Elmer Smith, when he came over, came in after Father Johnston departed, felt that this was dirty money. Uh, mm. and, and he just let Father Johnston spend it like crazy and get rid of it. And we'll get, get rid of all this dirty money. But it was a shock to members of the society because they would come and they'd be wined and dined and be told that the, the oratory was worth 3 million or 6 million. Of course, there was never any money. It was all sort of um, a shell game kind of thing. So yeah, and I think that does come out in the novels. Yes, yes, uh, yes. I mean, the Massachusetts bishop who was a friend of Father Smythe. Oh, yes, there's a question about who the Massachusetts bishop was that assisted Father Smythe. Um, oh, initially. Um, was, was he a friend of the family? Well, oh, yes, I, you, you did yeah, mention. Yes, um, yes. Um, Cheryl, Bishop Cheryl. Um, and initially, that would have been in the, um, the earlier years. I, I think they had, um, Father Smythe's family were uh, prominent Episcopalians in upstate New York. So they, uh, they, he kind of knew, I think might have met Cheryl in Washington or somewhere. So, so Cheryl knew of him from other bishops. And Father Huntington, the, fa the founder of the Order of the Holy Cross, uh, was also a supporter of Father Smythe. So initially it was Bishop Cheryl. I think it was Anson Stokes who uh, took part in the funeral. So um, they just basically left Father Smythe alone. Every year the li license was renewed. Um, he, he didn't ask to work in any parishes. I, there might've been complaints from, from people, but uh, it, I mean, Boston's a pretty liberal place. So 
Yeah, but Cheryl was mm -hmm. the first bishop who helped, yes. Would, would you repeat what you had said about Bishop Stokes? Uh, at, um, uh, at Father Smythe's funeral, uh, Bishop Stokes appeared and read the burial office. So there was recognition uh, by the diocese. They, they took part in Father Smythe's funeral in 1960. Right, so that means he was, um, the church appreciated him in some way. Uh, recognized him and he was on the list of religious communities in the Episcopal Church. It was rec a recognized Episcopal community. Um, now, interestingly, Father Smythe was cremated and his ashes, um, Elmer took with him. They were put under the altar, you know, the, the medieval tradition of the saint or the founder of the communities uh, remains, bones are put under the altar and Father Smythe's ashes were put under the altar. Then when the oratory closed down, uh, Elmer Smith uh, took them with him to New Brunswick. Uh, and when I asked him, oh, where are Father Smythe's ashes? He went to the closet and brought them out. And that was a bit of a shock, uh, but eventually they found their home in the family plot in uh, uh, Clinton, New York. I, I arranged with the parish priest there and the ashes were sent down and he was buried in the family plot, so. Oh, just as well. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, that's interesting, the wandering ashes. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Does that answer your question, Judy? Ah. So if you could hear um, our questioner, Judy Walcott, she says Bishop Stokes confirmed her mm -hmm. back in the, what was it, in the 1950s. Yeah. Yes, he had a long time as, I think, assistant bishop and um, Yes, I remember him once at, at, at the parish I went to in, uh, in, in Bright, Brighton, Massachusetts, but I just, I happened to get Bishop uh, Burgess when I was confirmed, you yeah. know. Yes. Oh, I mean the archives that were in the chicken house. You mean the archives that were in the chicken house? Okay, so the, um, Kathy's wondering, or Catherine is wondering, where now are the archives that you found in the chicken house? Oh, well, <clears throat> Elmer gave, Father Elmer gave them to me uh, on one of my trips down after I came back and, and went down. He agreed that I could take the archives with me. There were about 14 document size boxes, you know, these bankers boxes. So there were about 14 of them. So I brought them back uh, and had them in my uh, lived with them for a few years. And then finally I gave them, uh, I am the owner of them now, and but they're on, I gave them to the uh, General Synod archives of the Anglican Church of Canada. So they're in Toronto uh, in the General Synod archives and I'm going to will them, I've willed them to them uh, to, to be their owners. So anybody who has to, wants to look at them have to have my permission. Um, uh, there's nothing really, I mean, just uh, also all, <clears throat> All of my notes, all of the recordings I did, the notes I took, uh, and and my collection of the of the pamphlets and the newsletters is all there. So, they're pretty much the complete. And recently, a couple of years ago, some friends gave me another document box, which, I, which is what I've been using a little bit. I haven't taken it to the archives yet. So, so they're in Toronto. Uh, there's some very interesting stuff. There's a little correspondence with Ezra Pound, which I should write up. And then there's a, I sent, there was one letter from T.S. Eliot. Uh, he knew T.S. Eliot in London. And there was one letter from T.S. Eliot wishing him well on the founding of the oratory. And I sent that to Mrs. Eliot. So that is probably in the Eliot letters, published Eliot letters. So Father Smythe knew some interesting people, um, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that so the archives are in in good hands then. Yes, so they're in professional hands. You, yeah. Basically, you rescued them. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, the the, the idea the, the it's not exactly a chicken coop. You know how um, I don't know the exact terminology, but in New Brunswick, of course, it's cold. So the chickens and the chickens have a have um, light uh, light bulbs. I mean, they keep them warm. They have a sort of a bank of of light bulbs uh, that keep them warm. And they were, and the archives were stored in the attic above that uh, that uh, structure, so they were kept very dry. 
uh, and and uh, there there because humidity is the danger is the is the danger of archives and so they they were in very good shape uh, and so I mean I joke about a little bit of a smell of chicken but there wasn't really wasn't that much and uh, and uh, but they were really they were re very well preserved it was a wise decision rather than putting them in the rect in the bas basement of the rectory where they would have got wet with floods because uh, Elmer was True. yeah. At least mice didn't eat them as well. So. No, no, exactly. Yeah. Good. <laughs> yes. Well, um, I, I, if are there any more questions? No. Okay. Well, uh, I was. I, I just had one last question. The sure. um, your forthcoming book about the the sisters of the um, community of the Solom Church of the Solomon Islands that you worked with. Um, do. They're, they're still ongoing now, right? Yes. Well, the order, the community is an English community from Victorian times, Sisters of the Church. And they had schools all around the British Empire. Uh, and, and there are, uh, the community is still in England, Canada, Australia. And in 1970, three sisters went out to the Solomons and began the community there. And they've had, and that's a part of the community that is quite successful now in terms of numbers and so forth. So I was asked to write the, uh, I volunteered to write the 50 year history, which I've done. Uh, it's, it's publication is a little bit of a question mark for the moment. Uh, we've just had a conversation last week and I've decided uh, that I'm doing a second book for them under rather a rush circumstances. There will be a book of photographs of the 50 years with a commentary on it, which is much, perhaps a much more uh, suitable for, for the Solomon. So I'm now gathering photographs of 18 chapters of photographs. And after I have all the photographs, then I'll write the text and have a timeline. And that should be published for sure by their celebrations next June. But in the meantime, the, the basic text is there for researchers. And I think down the road, it will be published, but it's 180,000 words. So it's a little bit big. And, and so, uh, but for the moment we've set it, it's also much more critical. Uh, and it's, there are some issues of perhaps of confidentiality or hurt feelings and things like that. But the, 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 the photographs with the commentary will be more for public consumption and in support of the community. So I was their bishop visitor for some years, which means that I was the, the person they went to when they had difficulties. I received the, the vows, the promises and so forth and knew them very well. And I'm an associate of the community and close to the sisters here in Canada. But I think down the road, the, the, Can the Canadian and the Australian uh, provinces are not gonna survive, but the Solomons one will and probably the English one. So they've got all the, the usual problems of religious communities today. The Solomon's ones are um, staffed by indigenous sisters. Yes, they're all, they're all indigenous in the Solomon. Very good. Uh, and one, one sister got ordained in England and the Church of Melanesia doesn't approve of ordained women, so she, but she's managed. And so she, and, um, they're, and they're, they have a new life profession coming up later this month. At the moment, the Solomons are in lockdown, they have no COVID to their credit. They have had no COVID and no, no. Uh, they've been very strict with quarantining and so forth. And people are getting their shots, uh, but I haven't been able to visit since 2018. So uh, I'm missing that, but, um, but down the road, I hope to make another visit. All right, thank you. I think we're all set then. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure and a joy, thank you.